What job should marketing get done in a company? There's so many things that marketing could be doing. It's it's like the old saying of like, how do you eat an elephant, right? One bite at a time. So I, I think the first bite for marketing should definitely be an awareness standpoint. Don't assume that everybody knows who you are. It'd be great if they did, but that's a great place to start. I need to confess something to you. I'm on TikTok. If you've listened to this podcast, you know I've never been a fan, said I would never go on it, but here I am. Why am I on it? I'm attempting to grow myself, expand myself as a marketer, learn the platform, and obviously better get better at video, and just continuing growing as a modern marketer. Before getting on TikTok, I barely knew anything about it. That's maybe something for you. What have you not done that if you do do it, you could grow more as a marketer? Now, back to the episode. Is this episode right for you? Here are two main ideas Anna's going to go on to share in this podcast along with a million other insights. One, how marketers can write better copy, hint, brevity. And number two, why experimentation is crucial for marketing success. So who is Anna and why should you listen to her? Surprisingly, Anna is an extremely mysterious person. I don't even know her last name. I just know it's D and that probably is not even true. She started though, as she'll share throughout this episode, she started in sales working for startups out in San Francisco and then transitioned into a marketing role, which I always find great insights from those who weren't bred as marketers like me and probably like you. She shares tons of thoughtful insights on how to do better marketing, how to think better about marketing and really just dominate modern marketing. Even though Anna doesn't go on all these social platforms, even though she is kind of a mysterious anonymous person, she still gets how to do marketing in today's age, which very few marketers understand. Ready to get in the episode? Before we do, run the intro. Welcome to season three of On Marketing, a show where we explore what marketing is like really is. I won't tell you what to think. I'll help you improve how you think about marketing. It's February 2nd, 2024. I'm Jordan Ogren, a marketing strategist by day and a podcast host by night. Please subscribe to my weekly newsletter to get new episodes, extra insights, and the occasional photo of my cat. It's fittingly called a newsletter on marketing. The link to join is in the first line of the show notes. And finally, all opinions shared in this podcast are individual views of the host and guests, not those of their employers or associated organizations. Organizations. This content is intended for informational purposes and should not be considered professional marketing guidance. Listeners act on the information provided at your own risk. I hate that I have to do that, but it pleases the legal team. Thank you for being here. And then from there, you can do some of the other things that marketing also does. From though, Once you build the awareness, then you can start to capture demand or do some of those other things. Obviously, every company has its own philosophy and strategy as to what that looks like. But I'm a fan of shipping. And what I mean by shipping is to not really overanalyze what you're doing. Be thoughtful, don't be reckless, but ship it as soon as possible. That way the audience and the metrics can tell you where you need to optimize and adjust. What gets in the way of shipping early and often? I think it depends on the scope of the project, how many People have bought into it, how many eyes need to see it, how many rounds of edits. I think that bottleneck, you know, it's within the team or organization wide. That's, I think, where the internal friction comes. So the fewer people you can have in the room, you know, it's on a need to know basis. If you need to know, fantastic. You should know and you should definitely be sharing your ideas and opinions. But the more eyes on a project, that's when I start to see things slow down. And again, it's the paralysis by analysis, right? Be thoughtful. Don't be reckless. Ship it as soon as possible. Yes, uh, a word or phrase is coming to mind of too many cooks in the kitchen, which to your point slows down the production of the food. But in the end, too, I think it also dilutes the the kind of spiciness or whatever because everybody's adding their bit into it so then it comes out as this kind of bland or generic thing where if there's only two chefs they could kind of run with something to make it different so like i think agility or whatever the right word would be of speed is important today that's probably changed do you think that's changed throughout history where marketing 
maybe move slower in the past just because there was less like social media or like all these things were in today's time, there's more need for the shipping often and frequently, or do you agree or disagree? Or do you find like that to be true that we need to be marketing teams need to be quicker today than in the past? You know, I, I think theoretically, and I, I preface it with theoretically only because I've been a marketer since social media has been a thing, right? So I, I don't know any other way of marketing. I would assume that marketers in the past maybe were able to ship things quicker because they didn't have as many outside influences, mm. for better or for worse. It, it, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Um, I think there's a lot more noise now. And again, that's where people start to maybe formulate too many off-topic opinions or... I saw this, therefore we should look at it through that lens. And I definitely think there's a time and a place during the brainstorming or, um, you know, when you're starting to build out a content brief. But once the content brief has been cut, so to speak, that sort of production phase of the project really shouldn't have too many outside influences. Stay nimble, stay agile. And one of the things that I appreciate in my background coming from San Francisco is the speed at which business moves. So it's a lot quicker. And I think for people who aren't used to startup culture, that comes off as scary. Again, right? Like break, like move fast and break things. This circles back to my earlier comment of be thoughtful, don't be reckless, and move and adapt when you need to. This is, a, I think so many marketers and so many teams get caught up in classic overthinking. I obviously have that in marketing, but in general in life. So it's kind of like a thing that can easily seep into marketing um, as I overthink a lot of other decisions outside. A, a thought that I had that uh, came as you were talking is having that kind of this, you know, com even if you disagree in essentially the the briefing or the, the, there's a stage where all ideas are welcome, give all ideas. But once we've started the production or once you kind of, have a, if you disagree, you have to disagree to commit. You have to just say, we're going to do this even even though I disagree with the angle, like I can't keep adding my opinions or whatever to slow it down. So you kind of have this, because I was thinking, I'm like, well, how do you move fast? And I think it's key to have those things where it's like, we'll take all ideas to this point and then we kind of have to create it or produce it to your point. So another thought comes to mind is just marketing seems to be more inputable, quote unquote, like, um, you know, like I, I don't have any input for the finance, right? And this is something that's come to me because I'll see someone who's like in a lead marketing role and I look at their history and there's no history in marketing. And it's like, okay, like they have some business experience, but it's like, when would you ever hire a CFO who's never done CFOing? Why is marketing different? Have you thought at all about that or like why we devalue marketing or we all have opinions on it? Yes, I, I have lots of opinions and theories <laughs> on why that is. I, I think just to use your finance um, example, those things are easier to quantify, right? So they, they very much are a left brain, black and white. It either is or it isn't. I started my marketing journey in sales. So I left a much more lucrative career to move into marketing because I was trying to explore at the time what the disconnect was between the two teams. Um, it seemed needlessly painful. And in my quest to understand what that disconnect was, I realized that I had a stronger urge to lean into the awareness building and um, not only the education, but just the voice and branding of getting yourself in front of more people. So I think when it comes to marketing, it's unlike finance, it's more qualitative in scope. I think because it lives in a, sub a subjective gray area, people on the outside feel more inclined to chime in with what their thoughts and ideas and theories might be as to how a marketing objective should be executed. And again, kind of to go back to the guardrails of a content brief in the pre-production phase of whatever you're working on, that is the time and the place to, you know, maybe, and, and especially depending if it impacts other departments, to get the feedback and input from those other departments. But to know that once we've entered into production, 
we really need to have everyone other than marketing lean back and let them do their work. I think like the marketing teams or person marketer sometimes plays this, I don't want to call it like a quarterback-esque position, but it's like finance, like, yeah, they get input, but they don't get input from marketing on like what our budget goal will be. Like, it seems like marketing has to do more of this kind of orchestrative role where they pull all these insights together. They have to be in touch with all these different departments or whatever, and then to the point kind of run with it, which seems like a unique or or maybe it's the ceo or like different people have similar but like it seems unique in that way where um like it, there's kind of easier lines in the sand for other areas and maybe that's what i'm getting at is like marketing just seeps into everything where finance has a very clear box of like the the finance people do finance nobody else like i don't touch the numbers but marketing everybody sees a commercial online or they see to your point a website that you know, they enjoy and then they share with the marketing team versus seeing some better budgeting approach that I share with the finance. It just doesn't seem to be a two-way street sometimes. I completely agree. And and there, there definitely is an implicit and explicit double standard. Uh, I know we're picking on finance right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, finance God, people listening. God love them because... <laughs> We need you. Yeah. Money makes the world go round. But it's one of those things where as you're sharing this, I, I can't help but think of a conductor who is making sure that a symphony and all the pieces are flowing as beautifully as possible, knowing that there's this piece that needs to harmonize with this piece. And that's where these you know interdepartmental relationships come about. And someone for example, in sales or finance or human resources has a much stronger delineation as to what piece in that symphony they're responsible for. So marketing doesn't have that luxury, but I'd wager to say we probably have the best part of it because we have a part in everything, really. Well said. I love the conductor, the symphony kind of example. I love that. So enough ragging on the finance people. They're going to be unsubscribing <laughs> by the minute. What is something in marketing in the past one, two, three years that you've changed your mind on? So maybe you believed X and whether you've changed 180 or just slightly, you believe something different. Uh, social media immediately. I, you know, I still don't know how I would classify or codify LinkedIn. Some days it feels like professional Facebook and <laughs> other days it really does feel like a knowledge buffet, right? You take what you like, you leave what you don't. Um, it's a place where for someone who's um, naturally introverted, but can socially turn it on, I really find a, a tribe of sorts on LinkedIn. And as I change and shift in my career, that that tribe also changes and shifts accordingly. LinkedIn is actually the only social media that I'm on and it's intentional. And when I share that with people, especially as a marketer, people are almost um, either quizzically, how is that possible? How are you not on all the socials? And I think it actually gives me a leg up because I'm not in the trenches. I'm not in the weeds the way people are when they're consumed by social media. I feel like because I intentionally keep it at arm's length, I have a much more objective perspective of what's working versus what isn't because I'm so far removed. And, and that is purposeful. I like that. I'm similar. I, I am on uh, obviously like YouTube with this podcast and TikTok and stuff, but I'm similar where LinkedIn is my main platform. A thought came to mind. It's almost like the person who is uh, running a cannabis business. Like there's this thin line where it's like you can't go too deep into the business or else you'll, you know, be this person who's too high all the time to do anything. <laughs> but you also can't, you know, not smoke. I mean, how will you know like what's a good, you know? So it's kind of that thing where it's like if a social media marketer, just marketers in general, you're almost like dancing with the devil and you don't want to go too far because like with TikTok, for example, I never was on it for a while because of the negative ramifications, mm -hmm. how addicting it is, all of these things. And right. I hear that from others, 
but they're in other, you know, they do their own business or they're in a different place. But like for marketers, it's hard because a client will be like, where do I go on? I want to do social media. What do I do? And sadly, LinkedIn isn't always the answer for every a B2C company or whatever. So then it's like hard because it's like, oh, what is cool on Facebook? What's cool on Instagram? I'm not on them much. Uh, so I feel that too. And I'm still as to kind of what you said, still figuring it out of like, how do you do social media well? Because just doing it is not like no longer does that work. Like back in the day, having a Facebook account was enough. Today, you could argue some companies might be better off just put resources elsewhere than to just do generic kind of non-engaging posts on whatever platform it is. So I have also slowly changing my mind or trying to figure out where is my mind for social. That doesn't mean that you know people like us aren't staying abreast of what changes are going on these platforms like you you have to know like i i am curious by nature even if i'm not on the platform myself uh for example i follow the drum it's a publication and um it's a fantastic resource and they're out of the uk and i really get just so much joy from watching the ads that are currently whether they're viral or not but they have a lot of um like exposés and and video reviews on, you know, ads of the year and and this and that. And I'm not specifically in a place where I need an ad. I don't need to formulate ads. I don't need to ship ads, but it, one, it keeps me creatively, um, intrigued, you know, because there's, there's so much cross pollination between the mediums, just because it's an advert that's going on a billboard or a TV commercial doesn't mean that I can't use that, for example, in a marketing collateral at an event, for example. So I think staying on top of the trends is helpful. I just don't let myself get sucked into it. Be aware, but don't be consumed by them. Yeah, exactly. I like that. And I think that's a skill that I've kind of been slowly uncovering of some of the best marketers is this inherent curiosity or observation where they, they're they so curious and observant that they can take something totally irrelevant to whatever, to your point, they're trying to do and bring it back. So to your point of the ads, I can kind of understand a good ad and realize how did they tell a story in a way that was gripping? How can I write a social post that is in a similar way gripping through uh, open loop or all of these things that are inherent in good ads? And that's, I think, just good marketers kind of can do that. They can um, synthesize or take other insights from all these other places, but it starts with some level of curiosity, like you're trying to learn and stay um, kind of up on these trends, but to the point, don't be consumed by them. As you're sharing right now, I can't help but think of Mad Men. And I don't know how you feel about it. I personally love that show. I'm learning that it's um, hotly contested. People either <laughs> love it or hate it. There doesn't seem to be any fence writing with that show. But the reason why I like it besides the writing and the character development, because I think there's a little bit of each of us in, in all of the characters, for better or for worse, I think there's something very powerful about showing and not just telling. And what job outside of advertising? I mean, you you your feet are really held to the flame. You either got your point across or you fell flat on your face. And I would wager to say that being challenged with either shorter copy or, you know, the confines of some sort of medium or project being as limited as a blink test, a landing page, what's above the fold? Do you know what I mean? When you have such confining parameters, I, I don't see it as a negative. I see if I can master getting my point across in 10 words or less, again, that's arbitrary, right? Or the blink test on the landing page above the fold, how much better as marketers are we going to be able to tell the stories when we have long form content, when we have 250 characters, right? So I, I think I would like to challenge people to get creative with short copy, like be brief, you know, there's a time and a place to be explanative, to be verbose even, but attention is waning, it really is. So I would always just say defer on the side of being brief, not at the expense of your message, but don't use 10 words when five will do. I'm reading a book right now. It, it kind of sucks, but the premise of it's good that <laughs> we live in a three second world. It's called Hook Point. Um, the author is very um, 
kind of just like selling of his services, which is cool. But the, the concept of it is true that we live in these, you need to catch someone's attention in three seconds or less. And how do you do that? You don't keep blabbing on about what you do. You you have to be very succinct and somewhat contextual, right? You have to put that to who's asking, what who's like kind of changing your pitch, changing that headline for whoever the audience is because sometimes you have different segments. This leads into one of the main learnings that I want to kind of learn from you, this copy. How do you write above average copy? You kind of say it right like you talk. Let's just talk about some of the things which you kind of said being verbose or being too long, but what are some of the mistakes, either marketers or just anybody that's writing copy, maybe ads, social, like what are some of those mistakes that that come to your mind that are easily avoidable or at least we can start to make progress on avoiding them to then write better copy? I would say, and again, I'm just such a strong advocate for, for being brief and being brief doesn't mean being terse. It doesn't mean being short for the sake of being short. One thing that I want to make sure that I mention that has really been instrumental in my development as a marketer actually occurred when I was At my second startup as a sales rep, I had gone down to, I think it was the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco, and it was an uh, AWS conference because I was in the tech space. I'm still in the tech space, was in the tech space back then. And I remember seeing a well-known CMO um, as a keynote speaker. So I waited for his keynote to be done. And afterwards, I sort of ambushed him like paparazzi style. (laughs) And I said... I have a question. I outreach to CMOs all the time. What is the best tip you can give me? And then I just shut my mouth. And he said, as we were walking, you haven't earned the right to my attention. Get to the point. And I've never lost sight of that. Again, we don't have to be short for the sake of being short, but we have to remember that In a lot of these instances, we haven't earned the attention of the audience. And if we have earned the attention of the audience in building trust and thought leadership over time, we really still should respect people's time. So I would say word count aside, respect people's time. Which you would do through writing, brief, getting to the point, all of those things is respecting, not, you know, saying a hundred words, what you can say in 50, right? That would be respecting. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah, this, that comes up in so many other ways of this almost disrespect for the audience, um, thinking that we can, you know, attribute their journey perfectly. But then when we think about how we buy things, it's never perfectly almost having this like I'm reading a book right now. That's that's a anybody who listens to podcasts like counts how many times it's a drinking game every time Jordan says I'm reading a <laughs> book. Uh, but I'm reading this book about how we can think sometimes others are more mindless than us because we only have an insight to our own mind. So naturally then you would think Anna's not thinking about that much. She can't be thinking as much as I am. And I think that falls into the marketers where you you see it with Bud Light or some of these bigger examples where they just disrespect the audience by doing something or, or saying something. How do you, you can keep it to the writing, but just in general, how do you respect your audience? How do you, what do you do that helps you not do things that disrespects them or you gain their uh, respect to then kind of tell, tell them whatever you wish to say. I would take a page just from everyday life, whether you're grabbing a cup of coffee, whether you're writing a longer form article for a website. I think it's, it's, it's something that, again, going back to respecting people's time, we just need to get into the habit of reading a room If you are in line waiting for your coffee and there's someone next to you and they look like they're having a hard time picking a pastry and you try to strike up a conversation like, hey, I don't know if you know, but the brownies are awesome here. And they're kind of read a room. I wouldn't continue. I mean, you can, you know, continue speaking to them, but uh, you're wasting your breath. Right. So let's take that into a marketing perspective where maybe you're at a networking event or you're trying to network, you know, through LinkedIn. You have to be able to read a room, whether literally or digitally. And if people are involved and engaged with what you have to say, then that sort of implicitly gives you the space to lean in and share more based on the feedback that they're giving you. But again, if if you 
aren't versed and experienced in just reading a room in general, you're going to get into these, you're going to fall into these traps where, you know, sometimes you'll see marketing assets or the commercial or, or, or even conversations in everyday life where someone's sort of painfully explaining something. And if they just read the body language or how the message is being received, they would see, ah, this is an opportunity to stop. This person actually does know what I'm talking about. So now I can move into this stage. So not unlike the traditional funnel, and lots of people have different um, definitions of what the marketing funnel looks like, but I, I subscribe to the awareness, consideration, and decision um, buckets of the marketing funnel. So Yes, maybe the awareness funnel is a place to get a little bit more into the minutia of what you're trying to convey. But the minute you read that room and you see that people are picking up what you're putting down, all right, we can start speaking in a different language. We can we can um, give that information and conversation more depth and dimension. But it circles back to reading a room. I really like that because I think with just using this like pitching or that sometimes the best pitches are there. Um, they, they're almost in, there's an infinite way to do it because you're always, you're getting kind of these micro agreements or disagreements and then you change or pivot based off that. Now in my head though, I go to, well, if I write a newsletter or an article or whatever, there's no room to read in the sense that I just publish it and I don't know per se, like, did I go too far in that definition and it just kind of diminishes their intelligence because I should have just thought that they knew it, which then makes the cliche, know your audience. Mm. Um, but I also think just like good writing has this ability to keep pulling you through, whether kind of touching on a question or a caveat that you're thinking, that's probably when the audience might think this. So I'm going to write, you know, but here's some ways you can do this or whichever. How do you read a room or how do you apply the principles of that with writing or with copy content? Is it using someone to review it and then say like, where do you stop engagement levels or how do you think through that with content, with writing? I think it's so medium dependent. So if it's, you know, on social media, we can look at engagement metrics. Again, now if these are, for example, multi-page carousels, it's a little harder to decipher when the drop-off is, so to speak, when, when, when the person has, uh, you know, churned out of your content from a website perspective, it's, it's much easier depending on what the setup is to sort of heat map things. And then also see like, well, what was the time per page? Right. So if it's a, a longer form content and you know, the bounce rate is after a second, then <laughs> we're losing them somewhere. Right? Pretty quickly. So, so I, I think technology in that sense and being able to have access to those um, analytics and that data is super helpful. If this is something that we're doing and we're printing out, well, you know, that's just a fingers <laughs> crossed type of situation. A lot harder. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that maybe leads into a, the second learning that I kind of wanted to focus on is this it's kind of like experimentation or you're constantly kind of with the heat map, it's really clear of like you kind of do that and then you pivot from what you learn. So maybe just in a broad sense, why is experimentation important in marketing and why is it something that marketers should try to get better at or keep top of mind? I think marketers all too often assume that their audience only wants to consume what they have to share in so many different formats, because that's what's always been done, which is one of my least favorite statements. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people agree. Um, yeah. I, I think experimentation keeps things fresh. It not only for a person like me, and again, using the drum as an example, you know, to look at, at different ways that people are reaching audiences, just because I'm not, you know, taking those avenues myself, it keeps my skill set sharp. It gives me creative inspiration for other projects. And again, it's 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 one of those things where like you never know where inspiration is going to strike. So if you can just take it in, and then the next thing you know, someone's asked you to produce, uh, you know, a campaign on X, Y, and Z. You can start to pull from these different art, like inspirational buckets. And that's one thing that I really like about experimentation is you really don't know until you try. Now, the inverse of that is 
the data doesn't lie. So as much as we can have fun with experimentation, and that's something that I've been trying to lean into with regards to LinkedIn specifically, is that I challenge myself to try something new as far as like, you know, maybe I have a mini campaign where I, you know, the variable that I want to change is the creative or the variable that I want to change is maybe like my tone of voice or my approach in, in how I'm trying to convey my ideas and my messages. And I'll let that fly for a little bit. And again, a lot of that is subjective, right? You know, do, do I test these mini campaigns for a week, a month, a quarter, who knows? But I, I do periodically go in and open up the analytics and it's like, yeah, that fell flat and that sucks. And that's something that I put my time into. But again, if you have a healthy degree of detachment, it's a learning opportunity. So you, you learn from it, you move on, and um, you hope that the next campaign goes you know, better. One reason I really wanted to talk about experimentation is I've written in the past that some of the best marketers think like scientists. And I think for a scientist, experimentation is one of their main weapons because to your point, there's even a science to experimentation where you don't change all the variables. I'm just thinking back to my old, but you have these constants or these things that you keep the same because if, you know, it's like, oh, social posts aren't working. Let's start doing videos with a whole new different person. It's like, well, now we have so many variables. We don't know maybe what was sticking or not. So I really liked that piece. And another thought that you opened with was kind of this assumptions that we have. I was reading, again, drink again, everybody. I was reading this book by (laughs) Rick Rubin on the creative act. And he talks about how curiosity is suspending judgment. And that resonated so much because to be curious, you can't have judgments. Why would I experiment if I know what my audience wants? Well, there's this kind of duality of that. It's like you need to be confident, but you also need to be humble in the sense that you may find something that you would never have thought of by just being curious of suspending the judgment to say, I don't think podcast should work or could work, but we'll do it for, and that's the second thing is, is, the data doesn't lie, but it also can lie in a short period. Well, we did it for a month and we haven't got any inbound. Well, a podcast for a month, I mean, geez, like that, that's very hard to get. So I think that's also something too, is which is also in the experiment is define the time length. So, and what's your hypothesis in kind of this falsifying stance that I think scientists have that many marketers and I was at a startup before and it was this kind of like, it was anti-theoretical where we almost want to prove things right versus scientists and they, they, they want to prove things wrong because the sooner we can falsify, the sooner we can get something better. And I, I love that kind of energy or just that mindset or, or how that helps marketers do better marketing. Have you thought much about the scientist kind of thinking like a scientist lens in marketing? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, not too long ago, I used uh, an image from uh, Back to the Future. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he's doing these experiments and it's like, you know, marketers, we're, we're, we're not unlike scientists. I mean, we're a bit mad ourselves because <laughs> we're, con- we're constantly chasing like that, that elusive virality, wherever that is, whatever region of the States you, you work in, whatever vertical you're in, we, we want something to resonate. So I think just like you said, you know, for example, well, we've been podcasting for a month and, you know, we didn't close that white whale. <laughs> I, I don't necessarily think we need to stop, but not unlike content briefs, we need parameters and guardrails in place and we need to know what that constant is. Okay, is the constant for, uh, is the constant a month, irrespective of whether it's a podcast, a social media campaign, uh, promoting a newsletter or, or a blog post? What, whatever those parameters are, act as our guardrail. So that way we can start to tweak and optimize and be able to isolate what variables were working, right? And if we're starting to notice, if you know, for example, picking on the one month guardrail, if we start to notice that there's really no traction in general, well, maybe that has less to do with the platform that we're serving this information on and more to do with the fact that we just haven't tested long enough. But again, we don't, and you know, and the inverse could be true, but we won't understand or know these things unless we get into a spirit of experimentation. No, I love that. I just had a thought. I've been meditating for 
five years every day. And I think if I would have said, if I don't feel better in a month, if my anxiety isn't down in a month, I'll stop. It's like, I, I never get here and, and I can't imagine the difference that I have today because I spent every day for five years doing. And I think that's another uh, thing with these experiments or whatever is sometimes the, so for me, for this podcast, analytically, if someone was to look at the data, they would have said stop at the end of season one. The, the, the issue is, is I'm not using this to A, get leads or all that stuff. I'm using it to be more articulate with speaking. I'm using it to connect with people. So on mm. those parameters, those metrics, I'm nailing it. I'm right. way better on episode one than I, or I am today than episode one. And I have way more connections through the people I met, which is why Friends of the Show is a new series that I'll be releasing in the future where I'm bringing people back on just to talk about life, just to talk about cool things because nice. I made friends with these people. So I, I think that's that. important too for a business to realize sometimes the experiment, we might always, it's not always revenue. It's not always leads that we can get from it. Maybe it's building content assets through the podcast because our CEO can speak for 40 minutes and then we can write from that or, or whatever. So I think that's important to consider as well. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And this may or may not be a hot take, but the whole always be closing, you know, <laughs> you can thank um, uh, movies from the 80s for those mantras. But I, I would say as far as marketing goes, I don't know that we always necessarily need to be calling someone to action. I think it's actually refreshing to leave, you know, be strategic and thoughtful, but to leave the CTA off because not unlike walking into a store, walking onto, um, um, you know, at the car dealership, by nature, we immediately go back on our heels and we immediately bristle at just even the offer of help because sometimes you just want to take things in. You don't want to be convinced you don't want to be wined and dined. You just want to soak it in like a sponge, right? So the whole always be closing, I'm also not a fan of that. And, and I love that you're, you're coming at this podcast from a much more thoughtful, uh, long range perspective as opposed, as opposed to playing the short game and like, well, how many emails can I get? And do you know what I mean? It, um, I, I think those tactics work in the short run. In the long run, I don't know. It might be at the expense of someone's reputation, right? But again, from a marketing perspective, I think, you know, no, we don't always need to be convincing people that they need to take that step because as we had spoken, um, you know, earlier in this, in this chat, the buyer is much more sophisticated now. You know, the old school mentality of, well, you know, we got to we got to lure them in and help them cross <laughs> the finish line because God knows they can't do it on their own. <laughs> no, they're so savvy now, right? Like we we do our research by the time we've entered in the decision, you know, making stage of the funnel or our buying window, we've been ready. Do you know what I mean? So I I think people forget how educated and knowledgeable and thirsty for making the right choices that people are today versus in the, you know, not so distant past. Now I want to, I mean, I could talk to you for hours. So we do have one last <laughs> segment that we'll quickly get through here, but this is all about life. So we're going to leave marketing in the back seat because right. I truly believe life, how we think about life, it really bleeds into the way that we do marketing. If we're able to be humble, curious, that just helps our marketing. We respect our audience. We care about what they care about. So if, there, if you've watched the movie, if not, I'll kind of explain it. There's this movie called Inception, Leonardo DiCaprio. He goes into people's minds and he incepts ideas, or they do. And usually these are kind of malicious ideas. They're going to sell their company or whatever. But if you could incept an idea into the minds of all humans, so tomorrow we all wake up and this idea we believe is our own and then we act out of it, what idea do you incept? If I'm understanding correctly, the first thing that's popping to my mind is, is kindness. Hmm... I think there's just, there's such a lack of it today. And I'm sure every generation laments over this, but I think it starts with kindness. And when we can start being gracious with each other and reminding ourselves that a lot of us are going through a lot of scary stuff, a lot of 
tough times, a lot of difficulties. The the bad things that happen in life are re, are, are good reset points. They're blessings in disguise because when when these tragedies strike or unfold, it, it's a good opportunity for us. You know, not unlike the coronavirus, there was silver linings from that. Good, bad, or ugly, there really were. And I think for a lot of people, it was the catalyst for us to reevaluate what it was and what we are doing with our lives. You know, pandemic or not, so much of that circles back to kindness. When we start treating each other just even fairly, there's just so much opportunity for growth. And I I think a lot of the ugliness would dissipate because of that. A thought, I love that thought. And I think it's a virtue, uh, a thing that we need more of today. But a thought that came to mind is, I've read a lot of Rupert Sapir and some of these deep thinkers that essentially the thought that came to mind is like, I am you and you are me. And the fact is, is when I'm rude to you or I treat you, belittle you, I'm belittling myself. The I within me, the I am is the same I am that's within you. So that really resonated. And I think the outcome of that would be just amazing if everybody tomorrow started acting out of that, holding the door, letting the person cut in line who needs to kind of get to pick their kids up or whatever. I love that. What is a habit or a practice that you do outside of work, outside of marketing, that when you come back, to marketing or business, you do it a bit better or you have just more clarity? I'm really into movies. I mean, I don't know if I'm, I'm technically a cinephile. Like, don't don't <laughs> quote me out on my movie trivia. Because <laughs> once I'm on the spot, then no. But I, I think I just get so much inspiration. You know, they say like TV will rot your brain and the boob tube and all that stuff. Um, I, I'm very intentional with what I watch. Hmm. So I... I really love, number one, just kind of turning off that part of your brain and just soaking things in. And again, not unlike the ads Um, and even the ads. So I have a Roku streaming stick, you know, the ads that play where, you know, even six months ago, I'm just like, okay, I get that these shows are free. I, you know, I have to watch these advertisements, but I really started to enjoy the commercial breaks because Mm -hmm. again there's just some parts of my brain as a marketer i can't turn off (laughs) so i i see again you know how people are doing things and forgive me the lighting is terrible in here i love it well it just changed throughout the whole combo so right yeah it's 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 i have this mystique about me now (laughs) yeah it's it's a new england winner what can you say but yeah. yeah i i actually find myself looking forward to watching advertisements and again i I wouldn't be exposed to them if it weren't for the movies that i was watching Hmm. so i just find myself not only entertained but creatively energized because again you just don't know where inspiration is going to strike and to your earlier point when we set aside the judgment and they're just open to being curious you know, I, I, I find myself like, you know, I, I just watched Moneyball for the first time. I'm not a baseball enthusiast. Brad Pitt's all right, but it was a great <laughs> movie. And the storytelling in it was amazing. And that translates back into what I do. Yeah, it's an hmm. innocuous movie. But if you're open to the creativity, the compound effects, they're, they're limitless. I love that. As somebody who for probably two years, I didn't even have a TV in my apartment. I just was living on on a low budget. But I do totally agree that when you do it in an intentional way or you just don't do it too much, there's something you can get from it. I think of a comment, comedic uh, comedians, Um, the fact that they're able to everywhere be able to pull something out to then use in a joke. I think marketers somewhat are similar to your point of I can't turn it off. It's the same way I'm watching Fargo and yes, there's just so many like crazy things happening. People get blown their heads off, but like it's like these open loops and I'm then able to take that of these stories and how can I do that in my podcast or in writing? So I really think it's again, this yes. kind of just a humble approach that I can learn from everywhere and everything. So I love that. Yeah, it, I completely agree. It's that spirit of improvisation right I, so I was a theater kid in high school um, mm. some of those parts you know you can't turn <laughs> off but to your point it's like being able to improv to pivot on a dime to to pull things from your environment in the moment like the comedians right 
I think that agility is what keeps us sharp. Yeah, yes and I think is a powerful mantra yes. rather than no or no, that's not what I wanted or whatever. Just yes and keep it playing. I love it. See, you get it. <laughs> Final question, Anna. This is so much fun. Final question. What is one thing AI, all these things are coming and they're changing. We humans probably won't be needed in a few years, but what is something you hope doesn't change in the next 10 15 years. And it could be something you mentioned already, but what comes to mind of something you really hope stays the same in the next 10, 15 years? Oh God, this is so generic, but authenticity with AI. And as we're learning about it, just to pick on that for a minute, you know, the deep fakes and and whatnot and, and how there are just completely falsified images of who this person is because they don't in fact exist or, you know, using chat GPT to craft 100% of your copy, yes, again, maybe the engagement metrics are high. Uh, Does it actually equate into anything meaningful? Uh, That's debatable, but it's the authenticity that we lose in that process. You know, I I don't want to see us become, you know, and not just the states when I say a nation of automatons. Hmm. I think that's sad. Human beings have so much to give. We have so many facets that I think will be lost with a complete adoption of AI. So I think it's going to be a helpful tool. I know I use it as a marketer, but I really hope it's not at the expense of humanity. And can you see my background? It's like, I'm almost like yeah, fading. Yeah, you're almost in like, completely gone. It's very theatrical, right? I'm in a black suit. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But a really good answer. I think those who win in the future are those that are able to know themselves and be authentic because that'll be the standout feature. I totally agree with you. I love it. Well, before you completely disappear, thank you for coming onto the show. (laughs) I really appreciate it. If you want to find out more about Anna, everything will be in the show notes. So click it, Um, go connect with her on LinkedIn. She's an amazing human. I'm so glad and grateful that I've gotten to know you and thank you for coming on. Are you on TikTok? If you listen to the opening, you know I'm on TikTok. I'm exploring. I'm putting everything out there. And if you are on there, I'd love to connect. I'm trying to do my thing. And if you have any tips, if you've been on there longer than I've been, which is three weeks, then please share some tips with me because I really want to get better at TikTok, at video. And if you're already there, I'd love to connect. Thank you so much for making it this far. I am grateful that you're here. I have some good news and I got some bad news. Bad news, season three is coming to an end. There's only a few more episodes left. So what's the good news? A new season, Friends of the Show, a whole new show is debuting in November. What this show is, is I'm bringing back old guests, Friends of the Show, back on to talk about life, talk about marketing, talk about anything to catch up and see how are you doing, where are you at, and helps you as a listener connect deeper with the guests who have been on the show and helps me continually develop a relationship, a friendship with many of these great humans that I've interviewed. And double good news, my wife and I are having our baby in November. So while I will be MIA for a bit, the season of Friends of the Show will run every other week or every week. I don't want to give you a for sure yet, but just know that we're just starting. This is only the beginning. Thank you for being here. And I cannot wait to see what we accomplish, what we uncover, and how we all can get better at marketing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you back next time.